Nelly, who is the founder of Youth Specialties, in his book, Messy Spirituality, points out that since the beginning, God has chosen tiny things over the large, little David over huge Goliath, Gideon and his handful of soldiers over the thousands of Midianites, one solitary Elijah over against hundreds of prophets of Baal, one lost little sheep among the safe 99 sheep. Spirituality, he writes, is about doing the tiny works of God, little acts, small responses to God's presence in our lives. And Iaconelli believes that we Christians have exaggerated the tiny ministry that Jesus actually had. Yes, there were crowds, but even when there were crowds, he tried to avoid them. He, he ran from them sometimes. Jesus was around for three years, and he really didn't do all that much, says Mike Iaconelli. He hung out with a few guys. He healed a leper or two, a couple lame folks, a blind guy. He made some wine. He helped out three or four women. He raised one person or two from the dead. He calmed down a crazy person or two. He caused a scene in the temple, and then he disappeared. Think what Jesus could have accomplished if he'd stayed on earth for 20 or 30 or 50 more years. Think of what he could have done with all the technology that's available today. But instead, Jesus showed up for a little while. He did a few local miracles. He said a few amazing words and then left. But Mike concludes, his few tiny acts changed the world forever. Tiny becomes huge when Jesus is involved. And then Mary Rice Hopkins wrote a song called Little Is Much. And she too points out Bible stories like David and defeating that giant Goliath or Zacchaeus who had to climb up a tree in order to see Jesus because he was so small. And her refrain is, little is much when God lives in your heart. Little is much. Now I say that because it runs counter to much of what our American culture suggests about smallness, doesn't it? I mean, David Ray, a UCC minister who wrote the big small church book. David Ray went to his thesaurus and he went to look up some typical synonyms for the word small. And here are some things he found. Runt, shrimp, peewee, small fry, piddling, dinky, one horse, pint-sized, limited, meager, unimportant, petty, puny. And then by way of contrast, he looked up big. And here's what he found as synonyms of big. Great, grand, considerable, substantial, generous, ample, comprehensive, tremendous, stupendous, mighty, heroic, full grown. So David Ray concludes, our language reveals our values. And I suspect it's not all that different when we come to church. Jesus' parables often provoke us to rethink our values, reconsider some of our cultural expectations, reversing many of them, in fact, possibly setting us on a different path. But even those reversals does not necessarily change our basic ideas about God. We think of a supernatural concept of divinity who's almighty, right? omnipotent, omniscient, omnipresent, infinite, and so forth, eternal, big, big words. And because we recognize that God is the source of all that is, all of life, the source of all energy, the source of all matter and being, it's easy for us to give the impression that we think that God, the God of the Bible, is into enormous things, is involved in the spectacular, that God is, is biggest when we think of the brightest and the best of everything, the miraculous, the stupendous, the, the universe itself. God is bigger than all that. And by contrast to that, the little things we do the tiny impact that we actually have, the baby steps that we take forward in God's name, they seem so insignificant in the greater scheme of things. And so we wonder, what difference can we possibly make, really? For six years, from 2004 until 2010, I was on the board of directors of our denomination's local church ministries division in Cleveland. And in that role, I regularly received reports about church growth and plans for new church starts 
and evangelism. Those are some of the many program emphasis that used to be taken seriously in the national setting in service to local congregations. And one of the indicators of a local church's success assumed that congregation ought to be growing. So whenever the national statistics indicated a plateau in numbers or a plateau in dollars or just in size in general, over time it was considered a church in the early stages of decline. Because eventually it would not be able to keep up with the rising costs and the demands of ministry in the 21st century. Well at that time, the minimum building site that our board would approve for a new church start was seven acres. Because it was assumed that a smaller area would not be viable due to inadequate parking, and the need for additional buildings for activities beyond the worship space, seven acres was the minimum to get a church building revolving loan. Seven acres. By contrast, here at First Church, we sit on one acre. And you add to that acre the public parking lot behind us where the First Baptist Church used to stand, before they moved to their building on Washington Avenue at M32 near the cemetery where Paul Mosseri is now the minister. And if you want to hear his sermon, as soon as this one's over, just bolt over there and you get two, a twofer. But even if you add the parking lot that used to be the Baptist church to ours, we still only have a couple acres here. We're one third the size of what would be considered viable using today's church growth standards. In a world of mega churches, like Joel Osteen, right? Lakewood Church, Houston, Texas. I'm sure some of you have seen him on television. It's the largest congregation in America. They meet in huge auditorium celebrity pastors whose books regularly top the Christian bookstores, bestseller lists, and TV ministries, right? Like T.D. Jakes. T.D. Jakes has been called the most, most an influential black leader in America today by the Atlantic Magazine. Now back in our day, it wouldn't be these guys, it would been Robert Schuller, right? Crystal Cathedral, Anaheim, California. I'm sure many of you, I'm, my grandmother used to watch him on television, listen to him on the radio, because she couldn't get out to church all that often, and so she enjoyed Robert Schuller. Now he's now the late, great passed on, the uh, Crystal Cathedral went into receivership and was bought by the Archdiocese in Orange County, so it's now a Catholic cathedral, in case you haven't kept up with Robert Schuller. But these are the folks, that, big names, TV ministries, multi-million dollar operations, tens of thousands of members. Or Rick Warren's non-denominational Saddleback Church, right? 40 purpose driven. For most folks in America, and certainly for the folks in the media, it's taken for granted that those churches that have more members and bigger buildings and larger salaries and faster growing youth ministries are the ones who can brag the loudest of being a real Christian church. You know, Burger King used to have the slogan, the bigger the burger, the better the burger. The burgers are bigger at Burger King. Folks used to take for granted that if it was bigger, meant it was better. Now back in California, when I was first called to be the pastor of a 55-member church in Torrance, the senior minister of a neighboring church who has 700 members and a million-dollar budget, who had attended my worship services back when I was a pastor in Zurich, Switzerland, it was back in the early 80s. He said, Paul, you are an A-class preacher. Why would you take a B-class church? And I'm sure he meant it as a compliment to my skills as a minister, but it sure came across to me as disparaging of my little church in Torrance. It turned out that Southern California Conference used to have two different salary scales according to the size of the congregation. They measured them by numbers of members and dollars in the budget. His church, with 700 members and 400 in a worship service, with 135 kids in their church school and a budget of almost a million dollars, that was A class. A little seaside UCC had only 55 members at the time. We had three children, and the budget was not even 20% of theirs. We were B class indeed. Well, I'm real glad that the conference scrapped that old two-tiered system of evaluating churches as A-class and B-class congregations because, frankly, my little church was flourishing. 
They grew from 55 members to 110 in the course of my ministry, which meant they doubled in size. We were having discussions about if it got any bigger, we wouldn't fit in the sanctuary. We went to two services because the church was overly full. In my opinion, that makes it an A-class church. B-class indeed. Right? Think A for atom. The incredible power that's packed into every tiny atom of energy. It constitutes the awesome universe. All things, wise and wonderful. All creatures, great and small. Or A, like ant. Just think about how much work a tiny ant does every day. It lifts things three and four times the size of its little body. Every time I see the ants doing that, I say, there's a Hercules down there, underfoot. Or think of the amazing information carrying capacity of the tiniest computer chip, right? A mere sliver of silicone. It's like what that mystic artist William Blake said, to see the world in a grain of sand. We don't always appreciate the value and dynamism of smallness. And I think it's precisely because this world is so enamored by the enormous, measuring success by size, dazzled by bigness as much as by beauty, that Jesus told that parable of the mustard seed. And also pointed out that widow's two little coins. Because little is much. I think Jesus was trying to tell his church something, that the Spirit of God is manifest in what Mike Iaconelli calls the tininess. God is manifest in tininess. In contrast to the grandeur of King Herod's temple, right, all those huge stones and wonderful buildings that 